Welcome to New Life. We're so glad that you're here. If you're here for the very first time, I'm Pastor Chris, and for a few hours, I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. After a while, it's not going to be that way anymore, but we are glad that you came to worship with us and to hear from God's Word. And right now, we're finishing up a series that's called Learn, Love, Live, and Lead Like Jesus. Not surprisingly, the first week, we first weeks, we've talked about learning, loving, and living like Jesus. And today, we're going to talk about leading like Jesus. Now, even if you never came to any of the other messages, which if you weren't here to hear the other three messages, I would encourage you to go to our website, newlifexn.org, or the New Life app to watch them. But even if this is your first time here, this message is for you, because everyone in this room is a leader. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not a leader. That's because you think leaders maybe are political officials, or military officers, or principals at school, or pastors. But the truth is, Everybody is a leader because leadership is influence. If you influence anyone, you are a leader. So um, John Maxwell, I guess probably the first person I heard to say this, influence, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So that means if you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, you have children that you're influencing, so you're a leader. Maybe you're a basketball player, and so the younger basketball players come to you and ask you for help, and so whether you help them or whether you don't, you influence them, and you're a leader. If you don't help them, you're a bad leader, but you're a leader nevertheless. So we could think of dozens of different scenarios where we're influencing other people, so this message will impact every single one of us. As we look at what it means to lead like Jesus, though, We're going to go to today's take-home point. If you've never been here before, the take-home point is the one point that I'll be making from Scripture that we want to not only take home, but live out in the week ahead, and here it is. Jesus led by serving, and so must we. Jesus led by serving, and so must we. Think about this. Jesus is the Son of the God of the universe. That's a pretty amazing thing in the first place. And yet when he came to earth, he never exercised leadership by coercion, manipulation, or exerting his power over any human being. Originally I said over any one, but that's not true. He did exert his power over Satan and the demons. But that's a message for another day. So today what we're going to talk about is a time when James and John's mother came to ask Jesus for a favor. And it was about worldly leadership. It's found in Matthew's gospel. Before we turn to Matthew chapter 20, pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and love. Thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus into this earth so that he could show us what it means to learn, what it means to love, what it means to live, and what it means to lead, and what ultimately it means to live a life that is reflecting you and your kingdom. And God, today we pray for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide everything that I say and that what I say, even if it's something that someone here doesn't know they need to hear, I pray that you'd open up the ears to receive your truth so that we can go out of here, as Sam said in his prayer, not just to hear these words, but to put them into action that will bring you glory and honor and bring other people to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So it says this, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Now, as we read those words, it reminded me of how I've heard stories about Jewish mothers. Jewish mothers always want their sons to have the greatest advantage. Well, this mother, we don't know her name. We just know that she's the mother of James and John. She knew that her sons worked for Jesus the most influential people ever, person who ever lived. And so she wanted the best for them. So she said, I, I want you to let one be the secretary of state and one be the secretary of defense. And uh, the reality is every Jew in Jesus' day knew the Messiah was coming. The Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans and any other political power that got in Israel's way. And then that Messiah, the anointed one, which Pastor Alex talked about last week, would establish a reign of peace and prosperity that would last forever. So James and John's mother knew that Jesus was the Messiah. So all she wanted 
was for her sons to have the best places in the government when Jesus took his throne. And yet you you have to realize she probably wanted that not only because James and John were her sons, but because they had sacrificed so much to serve Jesus. Well, Jesus responded as he often did by asking a question. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Jesus would soon be arrested. He would be put on trial. He would be found guilty. He would be beaten, and then he would be crucified. And the disciples didn't know that, even though Jesus had told them a number of times it was going to happen. But that day, when Jesus said, are you able to drink this bitter cup of suffering? For us, if we don't know what Jesus was talking about, it might seem weird. But every Jew in Jesus' day knew what the cup of suffering was. It was the wrath of God, the anger of God. And Jesus knew that not very long from the day that he was speaking these words, he would be in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. He would be struggling in prayer with his heavenly Father for the cup to pass from him because the cup of suffering Jesus was going to drink was the wrath of God against all of us and against all of humanity for all of time. Jesus, the Son of God, equal with God, always with God, would be separated from God for a moment on the cross when he took the sin of all the world onto himself. And so what Jesus was asking was, are you able to drink that? And obviously, James and John had no clue what Jesus was asking because of this is what they said. Oh, yes, they replied, we are able Jesus didn't even argue with them. Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. Not the cup, but a cup. John would be exiled for his faith. James would be also executed for his faith in Jesus. But that would be mild compared to that cup that Jesus was talking about. Jesus moved to the heart of the matter, though. He says, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. Even though Jesus is God's son, even though he's equal with God, he always submitted his will to his Father's will. Jesus made it clear on several occasions that in his human form, He didn't know everything. Like he said, I don't know who's going to sit at my right and left. I don't know when I'm going to come back. In fact, because Jesus said things like that, there are some in our world today who think that Jesus wasn't the big G God, not the God of the universe. He's just like a a little God, maybe semi-God. But the Apostle Paul explained what was going on here. We, we read this passage uh, the first week of this series, and Pastor Alex talked about it also. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church, he said this about Jesus, about his self-limiting of his power and his knowledge. He said, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was God, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So in addition, even though Jesus is the Son of God, what he says here is, I can't give those positions to you because they're not mine to give. Now, when the other ten disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Look how holy the other ten disciples are. They're all upset at James and John because they would presume to want to have these two positions of highest power. Actually, I don't think they were so holy. I think they were experiencing a little bit of FOMO. You know? They were afraid they were going to miss out on being the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense. And so they started arguing and complaining about, wait a minute, I'm better than you, I'm better than you. You know that's what they were doing. And in the midst of all of that... We need to stop for a moment, and we need to think about something. We're talking about leading like Jesus, right? And what we know is these guys, these 12 guys, had been with Jesus for three years, day in, day out. They saw how Jesus learned. They saw how Jesus loved. They saw how Jesus lived. They saw how Jesus led. And yet when James and John's mom asked Jesus to put her boys on the top, the other 10 guys start wrestling for top. You know, you would think they would have learned what it means to lead like Jesus. On the one hand, you would think that. On the other hand, I'm sort of actually encouraged by this. Because when I mess up over and over and again, I just think of the disciples and go, well, you know, I, I guess I have some room for improvement just like they did. 
Jesus knew a teachable moment better than anybody else who ever lived. And he knew this was a teachable moment. So he turned to the disciples and this is what happened next. It says, but Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You can see where our take-home point originated. Jesus led by serving, and so must we. Jesus acknowledged that serving was not the worldly way to lead. The lords of the earth, the kings of the earth, the governors of the earth, what do they do? They lord it over their people. Look at me, look who I am. They talk about their authority and they flaunt their authority over others. And the 12 disciples had experienced that. Maybe not every day of their lives, but every day of their lives they knew one thing, the Romans were in charge, not the Israelites. They knew that they had to pay taxes to Rome. They knew that there were Roman soldiers on every street corner in some of the major cities and even in the little villages there was a Roman presence. They knew that a Roman soldier could walk up to them and say, you need to carry my pack a mile and they had to do it. And you know what Jesus said about that. He said, when a Roman soldier makes you do that, carry it two miles. (laughs) Show them the goodness and grace of the God you serve. So here's what we know in short. Jesus' disciples knew firsthand what worldly leadership looks like and feels like, what it looked like, what it felt like. So after reminding them of the world's ways of leading, Jesus taught two lessons about what it means to lead in the kingdom of God, what it means to lead like Jesus. First, Jesus told his disciples how they must lead. He said this, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. Now, Matthew wrote his gospel in Greek. Jesus had spoken these words probably in Aramaic. It's possible it could have been Hebrew, but one of those languages. But Matthew had to translate it into Greek. And in Greek, the word that Matthew used for servant is diakonos. We get the word deacon from it. You know, some church servants, leaders. But in Acts chapter 6, we find out when the early church was having problems with distributing food among the widows, they appointed diakonos table servers. They went around waiting on these widows. And so what Jesus was saying is if you're a leader in the kingdom of God, you have to be willing to wait on tables. You have to be willing not only to serve me, Jesus, but you need to be willing to serve one another and even the least, as they're often thought of, in my kingdom. Then Matthew used the word doulos for slave. The word doulos can be translated as indentured servant or as slave, a slave. We all know what slaves are. We, we all cast off the yoke of England back uh, several hundred years, uh, 270 some years ago. And 160, 70 years ago, we made it illegal in this country for one person to own another person, for slavery to exist. And we all sort of have a, a bad feeling in the pit of our stomach when somebody uses the word slave. And we ought to. However, Jesus says, that we're supposed to act towards others as if they own us. Is that really true? Well, the short answer to that is yes. The longer answer comes in the second part of Jesus' teaching on leadership. He says this, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if the disciples had choked on the commands that Jesus gave to be servants and slaves for others, now what Jesus is saying is, look at me. I am Lord, and yet I came here not to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Just in a few weeks after Jesus spoke these words, he would wash his disciples' feet, an act that only a slave had to do. He would show them that he was willing to serve them, as he said, to the very end. And not only did he serve them to the very end, then he died. When he said to be a ransom for many, what was he meaning? He was meaning he paid the price of freedom for you and me, for every person who has ever lived, ever will live. He died on the cross and he had to do it. He had to drink that cup of suffering because it was our cup. God should have given us the cup of his wrath. We should be the ones who are condemned. But instead, Jesus was going to be condemned. And in fact, here's the thing. If worldly leaders lorded over others, 
and Jesus is Lord of everything, then why doesn't he lord it over others? If worldly people in authority flaunt their authority and Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, then why doesn't he show his authority and flaunt his authority over everybody else? You see, the reason is because Jesus didn't come to give us a better world. Some people want a better world. Jesus didn't come to give us a better world. People want to be better. People want to be a little, you know, nicer, whatever. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to make a radical change to give us a whole new world and a whole new life. When he returns, he is going to establish a kingdom that lasts forever and everything is going to be perfect. But he had to die on the cross to purchase that future for you and for me. And Jesus wanted them to understand, if you want to be a leader in my kingdom, then you have to be willing to serve, even to the point of death. Now, in that moment, the disciples had no idea what Jesus was talking about, but in a few weeks, they watched him die. And then a few days after that, they saw him again alive after he rose from the dead. Jesus' style of leadership, Jesus' call to leadership made absolutely no sense in the disciples' world. And we have to be honest. It doesn't make any sense in our world either. It doesn't make sense in the world today. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? We have more freedoms than people, so many people around the world, billions of people around the world wish that they could have the freedoms that we have. And yet so often these days, what I hear about is people saying what their rights are. We have all these rights, but people don't seem to be talking about responsibilities. That's what Jesus was talking about. You see, we always say, you've heard this saying, freedom isn't free. When it comes to eternal freedom it costs the innocent blood of Jesus it costs his life on the cross and the freedoms that we enjoy personally and politically here in America they have come at the cost of millions of lives of people who have served to make sure that we have those freedoms so many of Jesus teachings turn the world's ways upside down and not just the Roman world but the political system of any time in any place over the past couple years People have asked me, Chris, why are you going to retire and and pass the leadership of new life over to Alex? Why are you doing that? I mean, you still have gas in the tank. Why don't you keep going? And the short answer is, as many of you know, six years ago, God told me that on June 30th, 2024, I will no longer be a full-time pastor at new life. And more important answer is, new life's not mine to give to anybody or keep. I serve at Jesus' pleasure. We all do. He's the Lord of the universe. You know, Jesus has guided me for 54 years, since I was 12 years old when I trusted him as Savior and Lord. I have been a leader for all those years because I've been influencing people since I was 12, not a church leader, but a leader. And here's the, here's the honest truth. When I have listened to his voice, whether it's his written word or whether it's the voice of the Holy Spirit, I have always lived significantly and I have always lived in a way that honors him and advances his kingdom. But I want to tell you something else. It's been hard to do that. And I haven't always done it very well. But here's the truth. The only thing harder than obeying Jesus is disobeying him. The only thing harder than obeying Jesus is disobeying him. Remember what Jesus said? He said there's a wide road and it's fun (laughs) for a while until it isn't. I mean, let's be honest. Sin is fun until it isn't. If sin felt like a root canal, nobody would do it. Trust me, I've had enough root canals to know I would not sin if it felt like that. But here's the other truth. The the narrow road that leads to life, it's hard, it's difficult. But it leads to life, not just here and now, but forever. And that's what Jesus wanted us to understand. So here's the question. Are you Jesus' servant? Are you the devil's servant? Are you your own servant? Because there's not really... Many more options. Jesus wanted the disciples and he wanted us to know through the disciples writing these words down to understand something. Serving others because we belong to Jesus seems hard because our fallen natures don't want to do it. But when we let the Holy Spirit lead us, we will gain Jesus' nature and life as servants will become not just bearable, but joyful. You know what? I look forward. People have been asking me this. Oh, are you really looking forward to Pastor Alex being the lead pastor here? I am. I'm looking forward to him so that I can serve him in the name of Jesus as I served Jesus all of these years. Then I look forward, and I'm going to do that through June. 
And, and after June, when I'm no longer on staff as a full-time person, I'll do whatever he asks me to do in the name of Jesus until I go see Jesus or Jesus comes back. You know, the reality is, I don't say that lightly, and I couldn't say it with a smile on my face even six months ago. But I've come to understand the importance of lining my life up with what God wants to have happen, no matter what it feels like. You know, the truth of life is, stuff that feels good first is usually bad for you. Stuff that feels good later is usually good for you. Usually, that's the way it is. So, Either Jesus is Lord or somebody else is. Pastor Alex understands what it means to lead by serving. You know, he didn't come here last week to become the lead pastor. He's been here almost 10 years. He came as the assistant youth director, and he served and did that faithfully. And then he became the youth pastor, and he did that faithfully. And that, then he became the family life pastor, and he did that faithfully. And now he gets to be the lead pastor. Now, I want you to understand something. Everybody out in the world says, okay, Chris Marshall was the lead pastor. Now Alex is the lead pastor. So now Alex is higher than Chris. But here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. I'm grateful that God has given Nancy and me these almost 23 years to serve as the lead servants of new life. And you know what? I hope he gives me 23 more years or 32 more years to watch as Pastor Alex and Rachel and Ezra and Joel and Kai lead our church family into the future. And so how are you going to respond to this change of leadership? If we've heard Jesus' words from today, then we're going to respond through our eagerness to love and serve him through loving and serving one another, through following Pastor Alex as we see him following Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, he told a lot of parables about a master who went away and left his servants in charge. And they all have exactly the same punchline. The one the master finds doing his will when he returns is going to be rewarded. This exchange between Jesus and his disciples in the scripture we read today shows us clearly that it is his will for us to serve him by serving one another, and even if we need to, to die for one another. And we get to do that by today's next step, which is I will lead by serving others in Jesus' name this week. The bad news about that is it's not going to be easy. It will not be easy to do that. The good news is Jesus will be with us every step of the moment through the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. So as we submit ourselves to Jesus and we call on his spirit to lead us and fill us, we are going to be able to serve others, not lording it over, not showing our authority, but showing them the true leadership that comes from God. And as we do that, we will be leading like Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, I just said the bad news is it's not easy to lead like Jesus? Well, it's actually impossible to lead like Jesus unless the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. And for those of you who are here today, and, and maybe Jesus isn't even Lord in your lives, so, so you can't have him send his Holy Spirit to lead in you if he's not Lord in you. So I'm going to say right now, if you have never trusted Jesus, Savior and Lord, if you've never known what it, even that, what that means, it's going to lead to a life that's going to be difficult, but the best life you'll ever live. But before you can do that, you have to do something that is simple. And it's also easy. Turn your life over. Well, maybe it's not as easy as I just made it sound. <laughs> because if we've been in charge of our lives all our lives, maybe it won't be so simple. But simple and easy is the first step. First step. A, B, C. A is admit. Admit that we've been sitting on the throne of our lives. That we've been in charge. And that we have not understood that Lord means master, owner, God, and that's what Jesus is in our lives. B is to believe what we just talked about here, that Jesus came to the earth. He self-limited. He came to be a human being so he could live a perfect life that none of us could live so that he could die in our place and drink that cup of suffering that we should have drunk, should have drunk. That's the right English grammar. Any English teachers? Give me an A plus, right? Okay. Um, we should have drunk and... He came so that we could have a new life. But we have to believe that he's Lord and Savior, rescuer from sin and death. And once we believe that, then we confess it. First to God, we have to say, God, 
I've been in charge. Now you're in charge. Your son Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm going to live in his power, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, by the way. So we ask for the Holy Spirit also to fill us up. So if you're ready to do that right now, I'm going to pray. And, I, and you can pray. Not These words aren't what's important. What's important is the transfer of ownership from yourself to God, to Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, thank you for creating the universe and all that exists. Thank you that you made us the pinnacle of your creation. God, we acknowledge that all of us blew it, but I acknowledge that I blew it. I admit that I'm a sinner, which simply means I haven't done your will. And so right now I ask you to understand something about me. I believe that Jesus is God, that he's your son, that he is Savior and Lord for me, not just for all of the world in general, but for me personally. I, I trust that truth and I receive it as a reality in my life. And I confess in this moment to you, God, your son Jesus from this day forward will be Lord and Savior in my life. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can live that new life every single day. And now God, I pray for all of us who maybe last week, last year, 50 years ago, received the truth into our lives and transferred ownership that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I pray right now for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives, that we can step into obedience more and more and more to Jesus' Lordship and that we can lead like him by serving from this day forward. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.